thank you, we praise you, Lord. Yeah. We honor you, Father, for the great blessings that you made us come before you. Father, we ask for your presence in your house this Friday, Lord. And we ask your Lord to have your way in our hearts and to serve us. We ask your Lord to bless the reading of your word, the preaching of your word. We ask your Lord for the anointing, Father, to grow in our hearts and in our minds. Lord God, that we might glorify you in our body and in our spirit, which are yours. And we give you all the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' mighty and holy. Amen. In Jesus. First Corinthians chapter one. Let's just start at the beginning of that chapter. Of course, the introduction is that Paul was called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. And so that's our brother. Then this letter was to the church of God, which was at Corinth. And I think this may be where the church of God organization took its name from. Uh, church of God, which is at Cleveland, Tennessee? Yes. The one in Cleveland, Tennessee. Our church of God. I call it our church of God. But there are, well, they are part of it. It is ours. Uh, it, it, there are other church of gods, but they're different organizations and they have a little different doctrines. But, but anyway, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Set apart in Christ Jesus. Set apart in Christ Jesus. Called to be saints. Amen. Amen. With all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. It's a wonderful letter, isn't it? Paul really sent a wonderful letter to the Corinthian church. And he said, Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Savior the Anointed. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. I want to stop there this minute. I heard, I heard something this morning and it kind of blew my mind, but I don't know where the idea came from. But grace or mercy is a person. That. This is what the preacher was preaching on TV I've last heard, night after we went off. I've heard that there's two angels following me. Grace and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I uh, will roll in the house of the Lord. Well, the man was saying that it was a person. Well, one angel named Grace and no mercy. But grace and mercy to me is the attribute of God's forgiveness toward mankind. That is how he <coughs> deals with man. In his sinful state. Grace is the unmerited love and divine favor of God. Of God. It's the love of God. It's the manifestation of the love of God through grace and mercy. Really, how much he loves. Okay. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And right here, it just plainly tells you peace from who? Grace be unto you, and peace from what? God our Father. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. Savior of the Lord. That in everything you are enriched by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So that ye come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, God is faithful, by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And we know that by the Holy Spirit of God, we all were called unto repentance. Amen. And by the call 
and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we came to know and that received the fellowship of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad you know the fellowship of Jesus Christ? Yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Isn't it wonderful to be a part of the family of God? Paul said, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no division among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now I'm a firm believer in this. <laughs> and I'm, I, I get concerned and I think about why let's just take a moment and think about things how many people say they are saved and they are child of God and they believe in God and they believe in Jesus Christ and hopefully believe in the Holy Ghost the Holy Spirit but why are we speaking different things? Where, where is the error? If we're born of the Spirit, then we are brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, and we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Should we not all be speaking the same thing? So what's happened? Where, where is the error? Why, my question is, why is the body of Christ divided? And every time I talk about this, there's a voice that comes into my mind and, and it makes me think about, well, one world religion, one world church. No, I'm not talking about a one world church. I'm not talking about a one world religion. I'm talking about having unity in the body of Christ that we all can come together and should have the same understanding and basically have the same doctrine. Why do we have to have different doctrines? It's a division. We're not supposed to be divided. We're supposed to be able to come together and to stand together and speak the same thing. It's the devil's work. It's the devil's work. And I'm not trying to promote a one world church or a one world religion and everybody just, you know, uh, and we know that in the end there's going to be a one world government, a one world church, a one world religion, but I'm talking about people who are professing to be a part of this body, the body of Christ. But we're divided. We should not be divided. We should come together. We have those who are teaching their doctrines that bring separation and that is not allowing a Christian to receive the fullness of the gifts of God in their life because they're bound by doctrine that it's not for today. This happened. It all went away when the apostles died and when all this happened, it went away. It didn't go away. It's never went away. It's always been. God wants the gifts operating in people's lives. God wants us all to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He wants every believer to have that. Do all believers have it? No, they don't. But a lot has to do with the fact that we have allowed the vision to come in to the body of Christ and to the family of God and cause separation. It's not supposed to be that way. We have a little group over here, they call themselves this, and a group over here calls themselves this. You've got a group in the middle, they call themselves this. You've got one over here, one over there. And we're so di divided. Are we supposed to be divided? No. Paul said that you speak all, all, that you all speak the same thing. And that there be no division among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. And even though we're a little congregation here at the Willsboro Church of God, 
Even just within this congregation, there should be no division. We all should come together in one mind and one accord. We should have our minds set on the same things and the same word. And we will see God work. We will see God move. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Shoal, that there are contentions among you. Believe you me, there can be contentions in the house of God. And that's not good. But now this I say, that every one of you saith, I'm a Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm Cephas, and I'm Christ. But then Paul addresses this situation in saying this, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? But notice what Paul said. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any others. Now notice this. This is where I'm getting into my point. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of, his, of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, and it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And notice something here. The Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. <laughs> but Paul said, but we preach Christ crucified. crucified. Now unto the Jews, it's a stumbling block. Unto the Greeks, mm -hmm. it's foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jew and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And I was thinking on this. Christ, the power of God. And the wisdom. Christ, the wisdom of God. You know what Christ is? The anointed one. Amen. The anointed one, the anointed one of God is, is the power of God. He's anointed with the power of God. He's anointed with the wisdom of God. Yes, he of course she Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise God. Lord, be kind to you. <laughs> yes, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Holy Lord God. Yes, have your way, Lord. <laughs> yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Yes, Lord Jesus. The anointed one. The power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty men, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And you know, 
I'm sure there are men and people who are called to work for the Lord who have come from good and strong backgrounds. But I find a majority of ministers who came up poorly, who were orphans, or who were people of low degree. Maybe uh, I've known great men who were great men of God who never really had a very high education level. And it's like, I, I use my own self because I was an orphan and I don't hold anything in my heart against my mother for what she did. I, I'm hoping she made the right choice in what she did, but when she gave birth to me, she left me at the hospital and then the children's home took me and kept me until I was two and a half years old and I was adopted out. And then yet, I wasn't a, a, a child who had a lot of friends in school. I got picked on a lot, uh, made fun of a lot. And I guess supposedly psychologically it, it does have an effect on children. I never learned well in school. I wasn't a straight A or B student. I did good to make C's and D's, and I have made F's, and I mean, I'm not ashamed of that. I mean, it's just the, just the way it was, you know. But you know what? If we, if we dwelt on our past, if we dwelt on things like that, we would never accomplish anything in life. But you know what? I grew up in church. I knew what Christmas was. I knew that Christmas was Jesus' birthday, and I knew what Easter was, that Easter was a celebration when Christ was risen from the dead. But I never understood the reason and the purpose. I was never taught in Sunday school that Christ was the only Son of God and that He came and died for me and was hung on a cross and was crucified and was buried and rose from it. I was not taught or explained to about the works of the cross or the purpose of Jesus' coming. Being honest, I didn't even know salvation. I didn't know how to be saved. I wasn't taught that. I don't know how the people in that church, I mean, they believe in God, they believe in being good moral people, they believe in doing good deeds, they believe in helping people, and I don't know if they thought that that's how they got to heaven or what. But I'm thankful that one day I had a real experience of salvation. A real experience Experiencing what? Experiencing the drawing of God's Holy Spirit. Bringing me to Jesus. And standing in the midst of some of the darkest darkness that you could ever stand in the midst of. Not being able to see anything but darkness. But yet could feel a presence of something being removed from you. And then something being put upon you that was totally different and that God through the Holy Spirit put a love in my heart, praise God, <laughs> to love Jesus. Because my experience was after I got saved, I gave my heart to the Lord, the first thing I wanted to do was to find out everything I could find out about this man called Jesus. And I've got me a Bible. I didn't go to Genesis. I went to Matthew. And I studied the New Testament. Because I wanted to find out 
everything I could find out about this man called Jesus. Because in my earlier years, when I was eight or nine years old, maybe ten, somewhere in that age line, I had an experience on a Sunday morning. And God touched my heart. And I saw Jesus, I could see Jesus walking the seashores of Galilee, leaving his footprints in the sand, and here I was, a little itty bitty toddler, trying to set my little feet into that big footprint. And I remembered that in West Virginia when it snowed, it snowed, and, and if Dad didn't go in front of you and make a path, you couldn't walk through the snow. <laughs> but you, he made a path, and you set your footprints in his footprints, and you could make it to wherever you needed to go. That's the way it was with the sand, the footprints in the sand. And God placed in my heart, even then, compassion for the sick for the afflicted, for the crippled. My heart goes out to people who are afflicted in their bodies. There's just a compassion in me, and yet I'm trying to be an overcomer because my what I have to overcome is, is that little bit of doubt. If someone is in a wheelchair or someone is crippled or, or they're, they're, they're having a problem, do I, can I overcome the doubt? Well, if I pray for them, is anything going to happen? <laughs> you know, you, you think about these things. What if it doesn't happen? Well, if it don't happen, then you were a false prophet. No, I'm not a false prophet. I just, you know, the devil will come against every one of us in times like that to try to keep us from being obedient unto the Lord. So I'm working on it, and I'm, I'm trying to rise up above, above that little bit of doubt. Well, if this person, can they walk? Well, yeah, I must believe. I must, I must do what God says do, basically. And I'm not always being obedient to that. And I'm just confessing to you this morning. I think we all have reached places in a, that we have not been fully obedient unto the Spirit of God because there's always that question, well, what if it don't happen? What if they don't get up out of that wheelchair? What if they don't straighten their arms and legs out? What if they don't speak? What if they don't hear? That's the enemy. I realize that's the enemy. But what fellowship it is to know Jesus Christ, the anointed of God, the one who has the power of God. The one who has all the wisdom of God. What a blessing it is to be a part of that. Paul said, because the foolishness of God is wiser than man and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your, your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty nor many no more are called. And I was, I was talking that. I sort of got off track here uh, in my conversation. But I can relate to this. I can relate to what Paul was saying. I was not one of the wise. I was not a man mighty after the flesh, nor mighty, nor I was not a noble person. I was an orphan. I was... Uneduc not uneducated, but my grades weren't the greatest in the, in the world. But to think how that God touched me and used me, and if you compared me to the others that I went to school with, I was at the bottom of the totem pole while they were up here. But see, God will exalt us. God will lift us up. Because when I was in my mid-60s, I had an opportunity to go to college, but I had to go first and get a GED. And believe it or not, this is what God did. I got my GED. I got a two-year degree in applied science. And I was an A student all the way through made the honor roll. 
See, that's how God will bless you. That's how God can take your life and change it. And I hope that whoever may hear this this morning on the internet or whatever, that I can reach you and if, you, if you've allowed yourself to be beaten down because you felt like that you was not a uh, part of that class, God loves you. God will use you. God will help us in our walk with Him. And God chooses to use the foolishness, the weaker ones. It's not always those that are rich and famous and mighty, but it's those who humble themselves and those that, you know, that God can uh, get their attention to. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And sometimes we who grew up as the, in the bottom of the totem pole, God can use us to confound those that are so wise and smart and whatever. You know. What it is, they see a change in our life. They see the, the, the drastic move from the bottom to the top. I would never have thought in my life and I'm almost 75 years old. And I would never have ever dreamed of being where I am today. And neither would you. But we have come a long ways. We have come a mighty long ways. And I often think about how many people that I went to school with. From grade school through high school. And even in the years of college. How many of those that I went to school with, just the ones I went to school with, is where I am today? And I didn't put myself there. God put me there. Having a TV ministry, pastoring a church, and doing the things that I do. I'm blessed, church. I am blessed, and I thank God for all of it. But you see, God has chosen me. Thank God. You better thank God that you've been chosen. Remember what the scripture said? Many are called, but few are chosen. And if you're one of the chosen ones, you better thank God and, and give him all the glory and honor that he has chosen you. And I'm thankful that God has chosen me. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen ye, and things which are not to bring to not things that are. Praise God. <laughs> you, just, you just feel a movement of the Spirit when you read this word, can't you? Just think about it. Isn't that wonderful? And base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen ye. And things which are not, to bring to not things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption that according as it is written he that glorieth let him glory in the Lord praise God <laughs> praise the Lord and I'm going to stop right there I'm going to finish right there and I, I hope that this has meant something to you and it, it, this word is wonderful it, it's just so wonderful Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God the anointing. If we want wisdom and we want power, we have to know the one who brings it to us. And that's Jesus Christ. Jesus, the anointed one. The anointed one of God. The Son of God. Praise the Lord. We have so much to thank Him for, don't we? We have so much to thank Him for. Praise the Lord. God bless you today for coming and giving me your attention. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord.